Good afternoon. Welcome to the i3 Equities webinar co-hosted with American Century Investments, where we will explore the concept of earnings acceleration and uh, applications to the equity portfolio. I'm a Tech Ten with i3, and I'm pleased to have Richard Adams, Vice President and Senior Investment Director of American Century Investments, join us today from London. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Um, Richard is uh, responsible for representing the firm's investment capabilities and uh, views across all asset classes um, to investors in Europe, the Middle East and Africa. So let me just set the context before we cover the topic uh, today, which is on earnings acceleration. Now, now most earnings based valuation models imply that you know, equity returns should be a function of changes in expected earnings, in expected earnings growth rate and expected earnings rate of return. Now, as compared to research in the first two elements, uh, empirical work on the earnings rate of return or, or sometimes defined as earnings acceleration or deceleration is uh, relatively limited and less understood. Um, however, in the last uh, 10 or so years, there's, a bit more, there's been a bit more academic research done on, in fact, on US equities. So obviously the next question is, you know, how about global equities beyond the US? Say regions such as you know, emerging markets or market cycles or sectors. Now we're familiar, in fact, most of us with, uh, with pharma French factors such as you know, value and growth and so on. Now, can this be considered another driver of returns in addition to those we already know? So in this webinar, um, Richard will tackle uh, these questions, I'd say in sort of three broad areas. Uh, firstly, the research thesis behind you know, earnings accelerations, uh, the practical implementation, and, and last but certainly not least, uh, the equities portfolio construction aspect. You know, can it sit alongside the other factors uh, and, and it's a driver of return? Now, in terms of format, Richard will present for about 15 to 20 minutes with slides. Uh, thereafter, we'll have Q&A uh, for a total of 40 minutes for this webinar. Uh, I encourage you, um, the audience, to submit questions via the question box and will endeavor to answer them in the course of the conversation. This webinar is for educational purposes only and does not constitute financial advice. It is intended for wholesale and institutional investors only. So for now, I'll just pass the time to Richard. So Richard, over to you for the slides and then we'll reconvene for the Q&A. Richard. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tech. Um, and uh, very pleased to be able to, to share um, some of the research that we've done on this topic recently. Um, I will say I'm personally very happy um, to be able to attend this call. I actually had the privilege of living in Australia for, for six years myself. Um, so I'm very happy to be able to pay a virtual return to your shores. Uh, and I hope very much to be able to pay a physical return in the, in the near future. Obviously, we'd love to discuss um, this topic, um, but I know we have plenty of time for a, for a great discussion today. Um, so really, the, the purpose of the study we undertook um, was to look at earnings acceleration as a source of excess returns. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to see if it held properties that could be additive to a traditional equity allocation. So the relevance to the growth versus value debate, the, the, the part of the title, today's title, was really to explore earnings acceleration as a potential alternative or, or potentially complementary approach. So we believe that earnings acceleration is an overlooked source of excess returns, as Tech alluded to. Um, and when you look at the academic literature, there's actually been very little work on this approach. Um, actually, we think that our study was one of the first to look at earnings acceleration in a global context. Um, as, as Tech mentioned, most uh, prior studies have focused on the US market. We think one reason that this approach is overlooked is that many managers use the language of earnings acceleration. Um, at its simplest, it means looking for businesses that are improving, and that seems like quite a, a sensible proposition. But when you look at the classic definitions of growth, they focus on the level of earnings growth. And much less work has been done on the rate of change, especially as the starting point for investment research. So our paper was really trying to look at the significance persistence and diversification potential of excess returns from an earnings acceleration portfolio. And just before I share some of our findings, it's, it's worth outlining our approach to the study. Um, so we're defining earnings acceleration as the upward inflection in the growth rate of earnings. And what we did was we looked at reported earnings uh, per share for companies in the MSCI ACQUI 
between Q2 2002 and Q4 2020. So for each company, we looked at quarterly reported earnings. And what we did, we looked at the compound average growth rate of earnings over the prior two years and compared that with the rate of growth we saw over the next three years. What we then did with, for each company is we, we observed the returns of each company and co compared it to the MSCI Acqui Index. So that meant that we could form um, an earnings acceleration portfolio and we can present some of the results of that and some of the characteristics that we observed in that study. Um, so on slide three, we can share the, uh, uh, the first set of results. Um, so what you can see here is really two sets of data. So on the left hand side, these columns are showing the excess returns of the acceleration portfolio and then the deceleration portfolio um, studied over one, two and three year periods. And I think this establishes quite clearly that link between earnings acceleration and stock price at performance for global equity data. Now, the right hand columns are showing you um, the, the same acceleration profile by deciles. And this is actually quite a powerful illustration of this point because you can see a strong linear relationship between the acceleration decile and the level of outperformance. So we can conclude that earnings acceleration does drive stock price outperformance. And actually the level of acceleration, the higher the level of acceleration, the higher the level of outperformance. We can see this relationship. And then on the next slide, we then extended this analysis to look at regional data. So what you see when you drop into the regions is the same linear ranking of deciles um, across major equity regions. So here we're showing the MSCI Acqui again on the left, we're looking at Europe, X, UK, the USA, emerging markets and Japan. And in case anyone's worried, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about the exclusion of the UK from Europe. I'm getting quite used to that actually when I, when I visit Europe at the moment. Um, but as I said in my opening remarks, we think this is one of the first studies um, to confirm the link between earnings acceleration and stock price up performance in a global context, because other studies have focused just on the US. So we do see actually this linkage existing in, uh, in, in markets outside of the US. And what we also wanted to do was we wanted to, uh, to look at the distribution of earnings acceleration by sector as well. So on the next slide, um, we can actually see the sector composition of an earnings acceleration portfolio over time. So this, um, uh, this chart actually shows some of the results that were probably most surprising, certainly to, to me in terms of the expectations that we had. So there are a few things here to, to unpack. Um, one thing is um, that you can see earnings acceleration is quite broadly distributed throughout the equity universe. Um, and there are some sectors here that we wouldn't traditionally associate with, with a sort of conventional growth portfolio. You can see that financials and industrials actually have the highest average weighting over time in terms of their representation in the acceleration portfolio. So this is not just um, a story of the success of technology, although you do, of course, see that that sector represented in the in the data here. Um, so this chart is showing the distribution of earnings acceleration across uh, sorry, earnings acceleration companies across different sectors. Um, we did also look at the contribution to excess returns from different sectors. And as you might expect from this chart, we found quite a similar picture. So we found the uh, picture was, was one of diversification. Um, so for example, when we looked at the contribution to excess returns um, over three years, the technology sector actually comprised just 15% of the total excess returns. So again, you see this, this diversification picture. Um, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is that this, this chart is just showing you the earnings acceleration portfolio over time. So another thing that we looked at, which is in, uh, in a paper that we published, um, is, uh, is how the size of this portfolio changes over time in terms of the number of companies that qualify for the earnings acceleration portfolio. So on average, what we've seen over the study period was that about a third of the MSCI Acqui qualified for the earnings acceleration portfolio, given those definitions that I, I, I mentioned, comparing the prior two years growth with the next three years growth. Um, so you can see that there is quite a broad distribution, but even within that, we actually found some cyclical variants. So uh, it was interesting to note that the percentage of companies in the Acqui that qualified for the earnings acceleration portfolio, the lowest number we observed was 17% of the universe in 2006, and the highest value we saw was 47% um, in 2010. Um, so the overall picture there is that the size of the acceleration opportunity set 
actually shows some counter cyclical variance and there is some logic to this because of course when the economy is close to peak you might find a lot of companies that have high absolute levels of growth but it's going to be harder for those companies to continue to accelerate their earnings from that point and conversely when there's a shock to the economy and um, this increases the size of the opportunity set because we see companies starting from a lower base from which to accelerate their earnings and you can see some signs of this on the on this chart if you look at the um the light green shaded sector technology you can see actually that um that weighting is quite stable over time if you look for example at financials the at the bottom of the chart and the dark green you can see some of this counter cyclical variance so you can see actually the uh, the weight is starting to decline actually as financials were rallying into 2007 and then you can see the opportunity set increase in 2009 obviously when that sector, uh, sector in particular was hit very hard by the, the global financial crisis so this brings me on to my, uh, my, my last point on the next slide. Um, and what we also wanted to do was we wanted to try and examine how this earnings acceleration portfolio would fit into a broader portfolio context. So we conducted a statistical test, which we show here. Um, and so the test we did was a t-test. And, and just in case any of, your, any of the listeners today are, are, are like me, that these days the most common t-test I do um, is checking whether I put milk in, in my Earl Grey. It's been a long time since I studied statistics. So let me just explain what we're looking for in this particular test. Um, of course, the t-test um, is looking at three values um, and it's looking at the extent to which the difference um, in the average of two series can be explained with reference to a third variable. So here, what we're looking at is we're trying to look at the average exposures of the acceleration and deceleration portfolio and see to what extent those differences are explained by, uh, by three additional factors, which here, as you can see, are price momentum and book to price um, as a measure of value and size as well. So what this data is telling us um, is that there is no statistically significant difference in exposures to either price momentum or size. Um, so the, the difference between the two portfolio, portfolios is not meaningfully explained um, by either exposure to momentum or by size. We can conclude that it is independent of those factors. The exposure to, um, to, to book to price needs a little bit more explanation. So that, of course, as I mentioned, is a, a common measure of value. Um, and we do see some slight differences here between the two, uh, between the two portfolios. So let's dig, dig into this point about value a little bit more and we can see this actually how it's evolved on the next slide. So although we did find some, some significance in terms of the difference between the two portfolios, um, what you can see here is that over time, the overall magnitude of those exposures to, uh, to, to value is actually very low. Um, so um, you can see actually on, on average, the exposure is close to neutral. And in fact, the tilt in terms of the value exposure in the acceleration portfolio was just 0 0.07. Now, if you looked at a, a, a um, conventional value portfolio, we would expect to see tilts roughly 10 times greater than that. So we certainly find that value portfolios normally have a value tilt of between 0.8 and 1. So there's actually a very mild value tilt in here. Um, so I think um, you know, when you look at the, uh, uh, the uh, conclusions here, um, in particular in the way that we relate this to the, to the title of, um, of today's presentation, um, we can see that the earnings acceleration portfolio is actually largely independent of momentum, value and size exposures. And so this does suggest that earnings acceleration can be diversifying within a traditional equity allocation scheme. Um, so on the next slide, I'm going to try and uh, try and pull all of this together, everything we've, we've covered so far. Um, so the data that I shared and these conclusions are all in the paper that we've published. So I'm not going to go through, uh, through everything here. Um, but what we can see from the data is that we've established a link between earnings acceleration and stock price up performance that is significant and that can be observed across different equity regions and different sectors. Um, to confirm this point, we found that the higher the rate of acceleration, um, the higher the level of outperformance. I mentioned that we did see some counter cyclical variants in the size of the acceleration opportunity set, but we also see that each sector continues to be significantly represented over time, and that opportunity set remains quite broad through different market environments. Uh, we've seen, I think we conclude that at best, there is a weak relationship between the earnings acceleration portfolio and equity factors, um, specifically momentum, value and size. And so building on this last point, we therefore concluded 
that an earnings acceleration portfolio would be additive to both the returns and the diversification of a traditional equity allocation scheme. And that really is the finding that we thought um, merited, uh, merited sharing more broadly. Um, so Tech, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share our findings. And I'd be very happy to, to open up for any questions. Thank you very much, Richard. That was really interesting. And I particularly like um, a couple of the slides there, uh, which I'm, I'm sure we'll discuss a bit more on popular construction and how the various factors uh, tend, tend to in interact. Um, now, perhaps just to kick off, um, let, let's talk about the assumptions. And, and as I understand, this model assumes perfect foresight uh, to forecasting earnings. And, and I was going to ask you what, what crystal ball you have. But I guess more seriously, you know, the difference between you know, you've got estimates, you've got observed earnings, and how visible, when you talk about visibility, to what degree uh, do you have visibility on future earnings? So talk about your assumptions there. Yeah, uh, no, it's, it's a great point to make. So, so obviously what we've done in, in, in the study is we tried to con construct a model to study earnings acceleration. And, and as you know, every model has assumptions in it. So the so it's important thing is to identify the assumptions and then see what happens when you relax them and you start to, to think about the practical mm -hmm. application. So one of the most important points is that, that you picked up on is that I, um, in the study, we looked at reported earnings per share. And, and the reason for that choice was quite deliberate. There are a couple of challenges we found in using estimates. Um, one of the challenges is that estimates are not static over time. Of course, they, they, they move and sometimes quite a lot. So we have this problem that if we look to estimates, they tend to lag the actual reported earnings per share. So you're trying to fix onto a target that is moving over time. And, and specifically, in some uh, markets, those estimates can be very materially wrong. So if you look at the US market in 2008, um, 12 months out, analyst estimates were 47% too high. So obviously you saw an enormous difference in that particular mm. market between the, the estimates and reported earnings. So, so there was a quite deliberate choice to use reported earnings per share, but you're quite right that that does imply a degree of perfect foresight because we have the advantage of knowing which portfolios accelerated over the next three years. So I think when you relax that assumption, obviously that is not a realistic real world assumption, but when you translate that into into practice, there are, there are two things that, that sort of come out of that. Um, one is that you don't need perfect foresight. You need to have some skill at forecasting the path of earnings, having some skill at being able to identify which companies are going to accelerate. Mm -hmm. the second point is that in reality, we're not trying to forecast the entire market. You do not need to, to be able to do this for the entire opportunity set. And that's why your point about visibility is extremely important. Generally speaking, um, if we sort of think about this in the in, in the real world, then that that visibility, the ex ante visibility into into what the um, the path of earnings is likely to be over the next three years is really the critical factor. And what we find is that the more um, data we can find, the more evidence we can find to support the sustainability of earnings acceleration, the more likely that the company is going to be able to continue its 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 acceleration and fit that profile. So it is a real world. Sorry, it is it, it is a, a model assumption. Um, but we think there's still validity when we translate that into the real world of portfolio investing. You don't actually need portfolio, uh, sorry, you don't need perfect insight to capture the alpha. Um, so um, Richard, there's a question from the, the audience, in fact, um, um, in a sense, asking about the hypothesis. So let, let's cover that before we go into the others. Um, so the question is, do you have a hypothesis for why um, EPS or I guess earnings per share acceleration works? Uh, and yeah. then better still, if you have some analysis. Um, so that's a great question. So yes, this is certainly something that we that we reflected on, and we would ascribe it to behavioural biases. So there's been a lot of documented work, obviously, on behavioural inefficiencies, and I think a couple that we would identify is is one of the things that you see when you look um, at any company is you see cyclicality in its earnings. I mean, you, even for a secular business, there is a product cycle, so you see some amplitude. <coughs> excuse me, in in, in the earnings. Um, and what you tend to find in reality is that when you look at our estimates of the future, I guess humans' estimates of the future, um, they tend to be overly linear. So if you think about a company, and let's say it grew its earnings at 7% last year, very often what you'll see 
is that consensus will say, well, next year it will be 8% and, and the year after that it will be 9%. And by the way, you see the same thing in GDP data. If you look at, for example, Federal Reserve estimates, mm. you tend to find the sort of very linear assumptions. And we know that that's not actually the reality in terms of the path that companies take. So I think that analysts tend to think in an excessively linear way. And they, they tend, to, as a community, analysts tend to be slow to recognize the implications of change. And there are some behavioral biases that explain that, like, for example, inertia um, and anchoring to uh, anchoring to the past. So I think it's really that sort of slowness to recognize change that exists for behavioral reasons that, that, that means that this anomaly exists um, that, uh, um, that, that, that allows any acceleration companies to, to outperform. That's interesting. And, and there's a follow-up question here. Um, so how do you treat companies with earnings that is either negative or inconsequential? Um, that, so that's a really good question. So one of the things that we did in the study, actually, we, we debated this a lot at the, at, at the outset, is here we are just using earnings acceleration as a proxy for business improvement or for financial acceleration. And, and I think the study shows that it is a useful proxy but in reality, actually, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question um, because, for example, if we were looking at an early stage software business, it might be growing its revenues quite fast. But exactly to the, to the question, it may have negative earnings or it may have um, it may have inconsequential earnings. So what you find in reality, of, of course, is that earnings is not always the best way to value companies. Some companies might be better looking at um, looking at sales or or, or, or EBITDA, and that really comes down to the to the, uh, the knowledge of uh, individual analysts in terms of the best way. To assess their companies, so a more detailed study might be interesting to try and identify what the most relevant metrics were. But we thought it was it was quite instructive that even using that proxy of earnings mm. acceleration, we still see this linkage. It's a decent proxy for financial performance, but but you're right in reality that there is a bit more granularity that we can build in. Yeah, I, I guess I'd like to pick up from you know your your answer and, and you mentioned um, um, cash flow and, uh, and, and revenues and so on. And I thought um, my, my I've got a story here. In fact, I, I in, in preparation for this webinar, I had the uh, the pleasure, or if you like, the privilege to read um, the book that was written by your founder, uh, Jim Stowers. Um, it's a very good title, The Best is Yet to Be, and it's written some almost 15 years ago. And, and in this um, book, he relates the story of how um, he was with his stockbroker, I think his favorite stockbroker, obviously the one that gives him the best recommendations, a gentleman by the name of Dick Dryhaus of Chicago. Uh, and he was searching for, you know, accelerated earnings and revenues and realized obviously this method and this, this uh, phrase which he says money follows earnings uh, and he was using in fact an IBM I think mainframe to, to program earnings uh, came to a point where Dick suggested that, that he do the same for revenues so at that point he had then earnings and revenues uh, so I, I guess the question in fact uh, a similar question has just popped up from the audience um, we talk earnings here how about revenues how about cash flow is it linked? Yeah. Can we still use the same? Um, so yes, absolutely. Yes, so it depends on the company. Um, obviously, which metric you think is most relevant. So as we sort of identified for for companies that today are loss making, you probably would want to look at. Uh, at sales, I think that would be the uh, the best thing to do. Um, but you're right, I and mean, we in, in reality we try to build up a broader picture of the of the. Um, of the prospect for uh, for different companies in terms of the uh, the scope for earnings acceleration. So, so actually, that conversation that you're referring to, I believe, took place in 1972. And and, and funnily enough, today, I mean, we you know we we are a fundamental researchers first and foremost, but we actually use um, a quantitative screen that does look for revenue acceleration and it looks for earnings acceleration as well. Um, so I'm not sure it's quite the model that that, uh, that Mr. Stowers built back in, uh, in in I think in the 1980s when he was using the IBM machine. Um, but that's exactly right. I mean, ultimately, it's about trying to build a broader picture of companies. And there are, there are in reality, the, the other sort of uh, thing that, that isn't in the paper is the causality. Um, you know, we just looked at the empirical link. Um, in reality, of course, we would think more about the causality and being able to understand revenue trends is one part of that. Of course, there can be company specific factors that can cause individual companies to accelerate their earnings, even if the top line growth is stable. But yes, I think for sure, building a broader picture on reality is, is certainly helpful when you translate this practically into portfolios. Right. I, I'd like to jump into the, I guess, the, the, the portfolio construction bit and a couple of the charts you've shown in a correlation with the other known factors that we are so familiar. Um, and I think in, in slide six, you talk about, you know, using the T-test to look at correlations between earnings acceleration, momentum value, and, and size. So let's unpack each one of them. So growth, for example, I think in your very colorful chart on, on, on sectors, um, you know, we see technology 
and healthcare there as well. So, you know, wondering if those those results surprise you. That's one, and I guess it's a follow up to that. You know, when we think acceleration, you know, it alludes to momentum, um, momentum investing. Is that is that the same? Um, yeah. So, so in terms of the the sector uh, composition, I think the thing that was surprising was actually just how big the cyclical opportunity set is. Um, mm. So, we, well, certainly, I was surprised to see such a, a large representation from financials and and industrials. Um, I wasn't so surprised by the, the lower weighting that you see in technology and, and healthcare. And I think one of the reasons for that is that there's got, you know, we've come to associate the technology sector with growth. But a good example of this would be, I mean, if you look at if you look at Microsoft, for example, you know, a couple of years ago, it was growing its cloud business at, at more than 100% um, in terms of the year, year on year growth rate. So obviously that is a spectacular level of growth. But that mm. sort of business, it's going to be very difficult to argue that from that point, it would see its acceleration. So, so what you find or what we find in reality is that some of the mega cap tech companies, Apple would be a good example. We've not, we've not owned Apple for nearly a decade. And that's no criticism of Apple at all. It's not to say that it isn't a good company. It's just very difficult to argue that Apple now stands on the cusp of its acceleration because smart, um, smartphone penetration is so high. And because it's such a big company, it's quite difficult for it to meaning, meaningfully move the needle in terms of the sort of adjacent uh, products it's trying to, trying to move into. Um, so I think seeing that lower representation from the technology sector is not all that surprising because it is, right. you know, we, we are focusing on something different. We're looking for, for, the, for the, of course, the, the second derivative, essentially, the rate of change, which, um, which you don't always find in these very mature um, or uh, in terms of the growth being quite mature in some technology businesses. Um, your question about momentum. momentum. Um, so the interesting thing in the study is, is that there, there is almost zero relationship. Um, mm. between the model that we constructed to study earnings acceleration and price momentum. And one of the reasons for that is that what we're identifying in the model is we're looking at companies um, that are on the cusp of their inflection. Of course, we sort of identify them at T0 sure. when they have the acceleration ahead of them. But what it shows you actually is that there isn't significant momentum exposure um, in earnings acceleration companies before they accelerate. Now, what we find in reality is that price momentum will often follow earnings momentum. Um, but one of the challenges, of course, is price momentum, and you can study it over different periods, but, but commonly it is studied over 12 months. And in that period, in reality, you tend to see a lot of sort of extraneous factors come into price momentum. So we've come to associate um, uh, price momentum, I think we often think would think about the technology sector, but I remember back mm. in 2016, when you saw quite a significant star reversal, at one point, utilities businesses were showing the highest price momentum because they'd been outperforming because the 10-year bond yield had been falling. And certainly if you look at the US, um, utilities businesses are quite heavily regulated. They tend to grow their earnings at, at 1% per annum fairly steadily. So they are not accelerating businesses, but at times mm. you have other um, uh, sort of near-term uh, stylistic factors that will come into the market and will disrupt that relationship by, between price momentum and, and earnings momentum. So I think to, to sort of summarize, mm -hmm. price momentum tends to follow earnings momentum, but but not always. It's, it's certainly not a useful guide right. in our experience to, to, to earnings momentum. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a common product. Right. Interesting. You mentioned utilities there, and I guess my, my next question is around value. And I know there's lots of debate about value. Um, when I refer to your chart, I think it was chart number five, where you've got the multicolor charts with different sectors uh, again. At, at, at the bottom, you've got we see um, um, financials and industrials, uh, a fairly significant chunk there. And, and these are, are what I guess we see as traditional value sectors. Um, but but yet, uh, you had your other table where you did the t-test. You, you showed that correlation was fairly weak. So just curious, how do you explain um, that, you know, in terms of the value sector and exposure and correlation? Sure. Um, I think what it shows you is, so you, you're, you're right that in terms of the opportunity set, financials and industrials are quite well represented. Actually, when we look at the, when you look at the excess returns, it's even more balanced across different, uh, different sectors. 
And I think what that shows you is that there are multiple drivers in the portfolio. I mean, you see technology in here, you see some of the sectors mm. that you alluded to, you see um, the, the, you know, those more cyclical businesses. And the question really is, what do you get when you put all of that together? And, and the, the, the thing that actually, I, I guess, I suppose exceeded my, my expectation was the breadth actually of the opportunity set. And that I think is reflected certainly in, in this model you see in earnings acceleration portfolio that is quite balanced actually in terms of the um, the sources of it of its of its excess returns, and that is why I think it is it is quite diversifying to most other sectors. So it's really that that, that breadth, I think, that's driving. Right, right. And, and again, so let, let's say we, we bring everything together in in a you know equities portfolio construction, where as you're familiar, most investors will have some value, some growth, and, and other factors. Um, and, and we are, I guess, trying to establish that look, um, there's potentially a space for earnings acceleration as a you know, as, as another factor, as another driver. G given the fact that, again, back to your chart, where you know, when we look at earnings, there's some industrials, there's some technology. Um, how do you advise investors when you think about, you know, building portfolios? Where does this sit, you know, amongst the other parts of the portfolio in an equity sense? Yeah, sure. So, so, so obviously, I mean, that depends very much, of course, on the individual investors' um, allocation and scheme, the way they're invested already. So I can, I can tell you what we what we often find. Actually, we had a, we had a major global consultant who, and we once made this observation, this was, this was their observation, not ours, that, um, that this, this approach um, sits in between quality growth and value. Um, and I think one of the things that we found in conversations with investors is that um, a lot of portfolios have been pushed more and more towards growth. And actually what we said, because of, of course, because of the, well, the stellar outperformance of growth last year, but sure. the structural outperformance of growth over the, over the last decade or so. And so you've seen investors push more and more into the, growth side and I think the challenge there has been this year in particular we've seen investors taking some of that some money off the table in terms of the sort of the hyper growth exposure or tempering growth so we do think that over time earnings acceleration does offer a middle ground I mean one option is to go more core but in, 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 the, in the core I guess by definition it's harder to um, certainly to extract style returns so we think that what this paper shows is that earnings acceleration is a somewhat overlooked source of excess returns that can actually fit quite nicely in between a portfolio that's got those sort of those those twin exposures of probably quality growth that's the most common investment style in, in my experience and and value. Right. Mm -hmm. um, on, on your on your charts around you know, geography, in fact, um, just just to again clarify, we've got uh, an Australian audience here, but we've also got colleagues. Um, from all across Asia, Hong Kong, China as well. So I think it's, it's nice to see the chart on emerging markets that it's working there as mm -hmm. well. But I guess um, for the benefit of our friends in Australia, um, this question, does this work in Australia or is the market too small? Um, so, so yes, I think I, I, absolutely. I would expect this approach to work in the broader Australian market. The, the challenge with the data is that um, when you look at Australia, I think Australia has 64 companies in the MSCI equity index, so it's, it's not. I think it's about three percent of, um, of global equity market capitalization, and, and of course, on a market cap weighted basis, mm -hmm. it is quite dominated by cyclical businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think in terms of the sort of real world considerations, I mean, something like the All Lords would obviously give you a much broader um, opportunity set, uh, where absolutely I would expect this approach to um, to, to unearth companies that would fit the and mm -hmm. um, that would fit into the portfolio. I think the, the other thing that I sort of mentioned in terms of the, the, the practical application of what we find in the real world is that um, often with cyclical, uh, with very cyclical businesses, like, for example, the large banks or the, um, or the miners, um, quite often the variance in their earnings can be largely explained by single macro factors, whether it's a change in the, um, in the structure of the yield curve or, or changes in commodity prices. Mm. And so what we, what we tend to think about in, in reality on an individual company basis is looking for multiple drivers. So we would also ideally want to see some company specific factors. It could be a merger, it could be self-help, a, a cost cutting mm. program, um, mm. and also there's some sort of secular trend that might give us more confidence right. over time. That would help to sort of build up that picture. Um, so yes, I think absolutely it's applicable to to Australia. Although just through the mm. lens of the ACRI, you probably want to broaden the opportunity set. Sure, sure. And again, talking about cycles it reminds me of um, I guess times of crisis. Like um, we, we're sort of in one, if, if you can say that. Uh, but when I think of crisis, there's again there's no shortage. You, know, you can think of 1987. You can think of the the more recent one, um, the global financial crisis, 2007, 8, 9. And then last year, I guess uh, there's lots of discussions around what happened in March and April of 2020. So keen to get your comments about, you know, 
how, you know, in this case, your hypothesis around earnings acceleration, how, how has it performed over periods of crisis where there's extreme volatility? Yeah. Um, yeah, of course. So, so what we what we find is, I mean, you can see this a little bit in the in the in the data that I shared. You you see the way that actually the size of the opportunity set is countercyclical, and there's a little bit of change um, in the representation of the opportunity set. So what you see typically is that actually before a crisis, the you, you'll you'll see some of the more cyclical cyclical sectors will have a slightly lower weight in the universe, and what you then see after the crisis is you see those sectors expand and you saw this very clearly in the, in, in the data and the numbers that I referenced for the global financial crisis. So if I can relate, relate this to, to the experience we, we, we've been through in the last 18 months, um, not that much of that is captured in this study because obviously the, the in terms of the uh, earnings acceleration portfolio it goes up to December 2017 because we're looking forward at the next three years of um, of, uh, of, of data, so capturing to the end of 2020. So we'll have more information as, as, as we keep rolling the model on, sure. but I can tell you what we found in, 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 in reality, in terms of certainly how, how, how where we were seeing the greatest opportunities for earnings acceleration. What we found towards the end of 2019 was that actually um, one of the biggest concerns we had was that cyclical growth was slowing, and a lot of that actually was due to the, the, the fading of the effect of the, of the Trump tax cuts in 2019. So there was a concern that growth was slowing, and in that sort of environment, a lot of investors are looking for companies that can maintain their growth. And what we found actually was that the companies that could accelerate their growth were very well rewarded. So we did see that much more on the, on the secular side. We had more exposure to technology companies and to healthcare companies at that particular point in time. Of course, there was this enormous uh, reset in the, well, in the global economy, but also in terms of the opportunity set that occurred in March. In April and what we found was that actually the size of the cyclical opportunity set when, when, when we were going through the the, the opportunity mm. set in, in, in reality it, it hugely expanded and the sorts of things we were looking for actually let, I'll give you a, a sort of specific company example if that's helpful to, to illustrate so, so one good example would be we own um, an American business Lowe's and this is different from the from the Australian business Lowe's which I think is more a sort of menswear re retailer this would be more like a Bunnings in, 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 in Australia if you're not familiar with that for the US business. So it's a sort of big box home improvement business where you'd go for, for DIY. So there are some sort of obvious um, drivers of, of, of Lowe's specifically. So one was the fact that we've all unfortunately been locked up in our homes and uh, and spending much more time here. So that has prompted us to spend to invest more in our homes and our, and our gardens. Um, and of course, as we start to be released from lockdown, that means that we're able to go out and, and, and spend. So back in, in April, this was quite attractive. Of course, there was an opportunity for, for that sort of door opening um, uh, uh, driver. Um, so that was what sort of one driver of the cyclicality. Um, mm. But actually, there's a structural change. I mean, we, we are now, I think most of us are going to be in a virtual environment or a hybrid environment. So we will be spending more time at home than we have been uh, in the past. So actually, there is a there is a long term incentive to allocate more to home improvement businesses. And Lowe's has some very company specific drivers as well. So in the US, it often gets compared to Home Depot. And historically, Home Depot, frankly, was, was the business with much better business performance. It had faster growth, it had better margins, it was perceived as being better managed. Mm. They invested a lot in their online presence and actually they worked a lot on their in-store experience. And when you go into a Home Depot in the US, you're greeted by um, by a, a sales attendant who have an iPad and can direct you in these sort of, you know, these, these warehouses the size of several football fields, they can direct you exactly where you need to go for the different things that you're you're looking for or give you advice on what be, what might be most helpful. And so Lowe's hadn't really kept pace with that, but they actually hired a number of the management team from Home Depot and we're now actually starting to see that, that improvement coming through. So that's a, that's a, that's maybe a sort of good real world example that the opportunity set expands because you would expect those cyclical businesses to have their growth ahead of them. And I, and I suspect that we will see that over the next couple of years as the, as the model catches up with um, with the reality that we've seen. But that was sort of our experience that in reality, you want to look for multiple data points that support the sustainability of that and yeah. that acceleration. So that's the sort of real yeah, world. I think with the pandemic, I guess there's a pent up demand that most talk about. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, what you've just mentioned alludes to that, that, that bounce back or the very quick bounce back, um, you know, in a post pandemic, pandemic situation. Or I, I think I recall reading one of your reports where there was a remark that the best year for accelerating stocks was 2010 
I think that was just after, again, um, the, the, the last uh, financial crisis. Um, we've got a couple of more minutes uh, left. I thought um, I might put you in a, in a tight spot, um, Richard, if you don't mind. Um, going back to the book that I read, uh, re written by your, your founder, um, you know, the best is yet to be. And again, for our audience, I really recommend. It's an old book, um, but really interesting. And, and in that book, there were a couple of quotes um, that your founder made. And, and, you know, I don't expect you to go into his mind to read his mind, but that those quotes, sort of, you know, stood out for me. Um, the, the first one was, he said, if there is any question about whether there is true acceleration in a company, meaning there may be doubts, we sell it. So if there's any question about that, we sell it. I guess the question is, when do these circumstances arise? And if so, you know, in your experience, have you done something? Any examples on that? Um, yeah, good, good, good question. So, um, so it's been three years since I since I read the book, but uh, <laughs> but, I, uh, but uh, I think um, the way that we sort of think about that in reality. So, I mean, this really is a question of sell discipline. Like how, how fast should you be to sell a company? Right. Um, I think it, in reality, what we try to think about is, you know, when you think about acceleration, what you tend to see is you see an S curve. So you tend to see that the acceleration sort of in, right. in terms of the rate of earnings growth will, will once a company is, is, is troughing in terms of its earnings cycle, it will start to accelerate. And of course, once it reaches a certain pace of acceleration, it can't accelerate any further. So it will, it will decelerate and the growth might be high, but it will be stable. Mm. So one of the things we try to do in reality is that we try to um, think about where every individual company sits on that S curve. And that, that's an exercise we do on a daily basis, right. thinking mm -hmm. just about the drivers of acceleration, what's the rate of change that we're seeing and, and mm -hmm. what do we think the sustainability of that is. So that really is the driver of, 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 of the cell discipline. And, and, and by the way, parenthetically, um, obviously, that, that's a very uh, uh, a very firm direction from, from Mr. Stallis in terms of the <laughs> portfolio construction. What we find, actually, is that the further down the market capitalization scale you go, the more useful it is to, 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 to follow mm. that. Because obviously, right. smaller companies tend to be more uh, tend to be more volatile and the drawdown in um, in a simpler business, if, it, if with a small cap business, it might be one product or one service that is driving their earnings. If there's an sure. impairment, an acceleration thesis, that can be very, very destructive to capital. Sure. So I, I, I think um, the further down the capitalization scale you go, the more important it is actually to be very proactive in terms sure. of your sales. Yeah, just the, the important point about sales discipline and, and maybe um, running out of time, but last question just to cap up, uh, I guess this, this speaks to the essence of what we try to do today. Um, the other quote that stood out for me from, from Mr. Stowers, and he says, the most dangerous thing. Now, I guess for us in the investment world, we all remember the four dangerous words. Now, this has nothing to do with that. So he says, the most dangerous thing that someone could do is to invest in a company that isn't accelerating. I can imagine mm -hmm. how much compassion and conviction he has. Is this an exaggeration, really? Do you know what? Let, let me answer this with data. Maybe we could bring up slide uh, three, if that's okay, and then we can bring the slides back. So I feel this, this question needs an empirical answer. Um, okay. But what we sort of find, a good way to answer that, I think, if, it, if it's possible to bring um, slide three back. Right, okay, so, so this is now looking at the, the deciles. One of the things that's quite interesting here is that you do see significant outperformance from the top decile. Um, but mm. actually the underperformance from the bottom accelerating decile is, is actually much worse than the, um, so the, the, you can see the magnitude is much greater than the outperformance that you experience from acceleration companies. Now, when we looked at the actual data, so this is looking at the excess returns, but when we looked at the data, what we found was that on average, accelerating companies would accelerate their earnings by 41% through this, this study period. Decelerating companies would see um, uh, a deceleration of 153%. Of course, the growth rates were going from positive to negative, which is why it's more than more than 100%. And what we found was not just uh, not only can you see it on this chart. Actually, you could take the, you could take the chart down now. Thank you, but. Um, but you can see not only the excess returns, much more severe, when you looked at the volatility, which is vastly higher for decelerating businesses. And actually, we studied the information ratio as well, which we didn't share, but we have it in our paper. So the information ratio for the top decile over three years was 0.8. 
the information ratio for the bottom decile was negative 3.8. So actually there is quite a strong asymmetry that's borne out by the data in terms of the, uh, the, the I think the, the benefits that we've seen from an acceleration portfolio. But actually, yeah, I think there is some, there is some truth to that. Okay. The deceleration company can be very destructive to, um, to, to, to capital value. Good, thank you. And on that note, um, Richard, that's all the time we have. Uh, thanks very much for sharing your research and, and your views. And hopefully, I think for our audience here, we found something meaningful and, and interesting. Uh, on that note, thank you very much to Richard, to our audience. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you at another time again, hopefully in person. Take care. Thank stay you so safe. Much. Bye for now. Thank you.